We're going to start here on page four with a video about ways in which we can get that sample we were talking about in class on Thursday. So we came to the conclusion, both the classes we sort of started with, well, we need our sample to have diversity, right? To be very varied in terms of the type of people in it. But to a point, we want that variation to mirror, that diversity to mirror what we see in the population. So representative of the population was the key. So that's what we're looking for when we pull a sample. There's a big thing here. Um, this little blurb has two definitions in it. I'll quickly go through them, though I don't really test on them very often um, or at all. Uh, one is this idea of a sampling frame. Sometimes your population is so unwieldy that you can't just go ahead and sample from it. You can't apply these methods below to that. So we could even think of the literary digest example that you guys had to read in your knowledge check. We start with the whole US population. That's who we care about, right? That's the population of interest. And you go, okay, well, how do I go out and talk to the entire voting population of the US? That's not possible. So they went, okay, well, we need to sample them. I don't have a list of everyone in the US. So what they decided to do instead, right, the Literary Digest, was they went and found all of the telephone subscriptions. I at least hope this is how it went. It's been like a year since I read that article. Now, a less ambitious group would have used that telephone list not as their sample as a whole. They would not have sent out the survey to everyone with a telephone. They would have said, okay, now that I have the telephone list, let me do one of the sampling methods we see below. So there might be a sample of people after that, right? Or the robocaller only calls certain people. So generally just wanted to point out that this is all about narrowing down until we get to something representative of our population. But sometimes there is that sort of interim step of we need to find something tangible that I can apply these methods to. And that's our sampling frame. Again, not tested. You don't need to write any of this down. Just feel like I should define what the heck's going on in this paragraph. Uh, the next one is everybody's sample is going to be different. There's variation and variability because it is random. So if I told everyone in our class to go out and find a sample of people and ask them a question, even if I gave them the same group of people to sample from, we're going to get different answers. So there's that sampling variability. So now we get to the part that is 100% going to be on your exam one, and that is what are the different sampling methods available to us? And there are four, four big ones. The first one is a simple random sample, which I will lazily just write as an SRS from now on. Uh, a simple random sample is exactly what it sounds like. We're just going to randomly grab people with no additional bells and whistles. So this would be like pulling names out of a hat. If I wanted to get 10 people from our stats class to figure out how many of them had, I just come up with a good example, and now I've completely forgotten it. Oh, how many of them watch Project Runway? So I could get an idea of whether or not I should throw a lot of Project Runway references in to my lectures. Well, I would just put all 110 students' names into a hat, and I would draw out 10 names, and I would ask them, do you watch Project Runway? So that's a simple random sample. Super easy, super basic. The next two are the two that students always get confused. So I'm even going to go ahead and star these as just like, be very aware. Uh, these two tend to trip students up, and because they tend to be an issue, are very often things I put on exams. And that is a stratified uh, sample versus a cluster sample. So what can happen in my, my pulling names out of a hat example, right, if I'm pulling names out of a hat, it could turn out that I pull out all girls. And then say four girls say that they watch Project Run Runway, I might overestimate the proportion of people in our class who actually watch Project Runway, right? Because my sample ended up being all girls. Not because my sampling scheme was bad, but just because of random chance. And that is possible. So what you do instead with a uh, stratified random sample is you go, oh crap, there might be a difference because of gender in terms of whether or not people watch Project Runway. So what I should do instead of having one hat is I'm going to have two hats. One hat, these are terrible hats, one hat with all the girls and one hat with all the boys or men and women, I'm sorry, whatever, however you want to say it. 
and then I'm going to take 5 from each. That way I can make sure that I'm getting that sample with the diversity, with the variability that we were so concerned about in class. It sort of forces the sample to look like we want. And if it turns out that my classes are 60% female and 40% male, well then you just change these up and instead of pulling 5 and 5, you pull 6 and 4. So you can actually, with the stratified random sample, make sure your sample is very similar looking to your population for some characteristic if you're worried about that. So that was our stratified. Now how is the cluster sampling different? Well, in cluster sampling, it's kind of like a lazy man's simple random sample. Um, theoretically, you go in somewhere and the population you're interested in it is already lumped in groups in some way. So in our classrooms, right, you guys all sit in your little tiny desks because we both rooms have these little tiny student desks. Yeah, I'm not lying. So say that we have our rows of desks. We have six rows of desks in one class. We have seven rows of desks in the other. And so instead of me putting people's names into the hat, what I would put into the hat is all the row numbers. So my hat, oops, that's a terrible job of my hat this time. Oh God, it got so bad. No. All right, my drawing skills are terrible and I did not give myself enough room. That does not look like a hat either. But you guys understand that this is a hat. It's fine. Uh, instead, what's going to be in the hat are the rows. Not students, not their names, but the rows themselves. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, well, most of those rows have about eight people in them, maybe nine people. Ugh, well, that doesn't work out well for wanting 10 students, but maybe I'll just go ahead and pull two of the rows. So if row two from the first class gets chosen, I'll ask all of them, do you watch Project Runway? And let's say row six from the second class gets chosen, I'll ask them, and that's my sample. So it's, it's a little lazier. It's definitely easier when you think about the actual process. Instead of having to write down 110 student names, I was able to write down 13 rows instead. So, um, but you do need to make sure that your samples, your clusters are what we would call heterogeneous in that they are very mixed up and variable. Um, if they aren't mixed up, then you wouldn't want to use that particular cluster in a cluster sampling uh, example. So our last method is easy again to understand, and that's a systematic random sample. Um, a systematic random sample just means that I would count off maybe down the roster or physically in class and take every fifth student. Um, for 110 students, if I wanted 10, I would take every 11th student and say, look, you're in my sample. So just count one, two, three, four, five. And then once I got to 11, you're in my sample. Um, we do want more randomness in this. So usually you will roll a dice or something to figure out your starting point before you start your counting. But um, very easy to spot on a test or uh, describe because you're looking for every cape, every third, every 14th, whatever the heck the number is that gets you the correct number of people in your sample. The last one here is not one I ever test on, um, but it is possible that you may need to combine these, especially if you're starting with something as big as like all college students. Um, you may go, hmm, well that's, that's a big thing to fry. Even all stat students here at Mesa, I might do um, a little bit of a, um, what would I do? I'm trying to think. You might start with all the stats classes and then randomly select some classes and then within each class do your stratified sample or do a, a, a systematic sample or something like that. So you'd have this sort of stages that happen where you do both of these. Sorry, that's a terrible example, uh, but that's, that's what I got for you. Uh, this video is getting long, but I'm just going to quickly do the last two things because it's just, I think, easier than splitting it up. Uh, we do have some crappy sampling methods. Uh, one we've seen before, voluntary response sampling, uh, both literary digest poll and the political scientist back and page two or three. Um, those are both examples of someone who just mailed out a survey and said, please send it back. Um, and you only count the people who responded. And so that's bad because as we saw, you're going to get the people with the strongest opinions. Uh, the second bad method is convenience sampling. If I wanted to know about the stat students at Mesa, 
the easiest thing for me to do would be to just ask my two classes because they are convenient for me. Um, but you guys would likely be different than most of the other students on campus. I mean, I know at least eight students in each of those classes already. Most of you had me for 92. Um, and then I also have the fact that my classes feel pretty early. Um, so a lot of you were on the ball and might have priority registration of some sort. So anyways, you would be different than every other math cl stats class, especially those night classes. So um, with that, I'm going to let you guys try out this exercise. I will stop this video now and make a second video where I go over the answers to exercise 1.4.3 if you want to see those answers.